Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do here on my channel. I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover are a little bit older. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload. So I've been reading a lot lately and I mean a lot and reading is one of my favorite things to do it's always been one of my top hobbies but I kind of fall out of it at times because I read so much for my case videos here on my channel I'm constantly looking through articles and newspaper clippings so it's just a lot of strain on my eyes so I like to take a break from it but I've been ordering a lot of books recently been diving into a lot of books I've never read before and of course a large amount of those <laughs> Are true crime books. I recently ordered a book about three weeks ago and it is Vintage True Crime Stories, an illustrated anthology of forgotten cases of murder and mayhem, volume one. There is a volume two, it's currently in the mail. I did not realize when I bought this book, presented by a historical crime detective, which is historicalcrimedetective.com, that's my favorite historical crime website there is love it. I've talked about them before. This book is broken up into sections. The first 15 stories are from a very hard to find book called Enemies of the Underworld, embracing 68 stories by America's foremost detectives. And it is by F. Dalton O'Sullivan. And it was made in the year 1917. Stories 16 through 20 are from case files from Detective Thomas Furlong. And that was in the year 1912. Basically for this video, I'm going to be going over the case that they discussed in chapter eight, put it into kind of my own words as best as I can. And I also did a little bit of researching myself to collect some more information and tie up some loose ends, which with cases this old, there are usually some loose ends to tie up. And unfortunately I couldn't tie up all of them, but long enough intro with all that being said, let's get right into it. The detective on this case was Frank P. Geyer. And if you are a true crime fanatic, then this name may possibly ring a bell. Frank Geyer was a Philadelphia detective who worked for the Pinkerton Detective Agency. And he is the one who helped track down the infamous serial killer, H.H. H. Holmes. You know, the one who basically created an entire murder hotel. Well. After tracking him down in the year of 1894, yeah, a very long time ago, Frank Geyer was a very sought after detective in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. People thought if he could solve a murder case of that magnitude, he could solve any of the numerous small scale murders in the area. In the years before tracking down H.H. H. Holmes, he was still a renowned detective though, mastering his skills into the ones that would eventually catch one of the most widely discussed serial killers in American history. Let's take this story back to 1889, five years before his name would make national headlines. Midnight of February 3rd, 1889, Frank Geyer had been out all night the night before on the 2nd, trying to track down a burglar in the area that was tormenting locals. He had been working for hours and was exhausted. Should he keep working or head home? He decided that although his duties were of importance, he was still a human being and needed his rest. Rest that would help him recover from his long day and give him a fresh mindset the following day to continue on the trail of the wanted man. He hopped in a horse-drawn car at 8th and Vine and started heading home to where he lived on 9th and Firth. Not first. Firth. The car took him as far as 8th and York. He hopped out, making his way home, anticipating his warm home, his cozy bed, and a good night's sleep. This night though would go far different than these expected plans. He is near St. Edward's Church at this time and a man runs towards him out of the darkness of the night. This man is horror struck, completely frazzled. As soon as this man gets close enough, Frank realizes that he knows the man. It's a known gambler in the area whose name is Parker. Frank asks him what's going on. And the man replies that a girl had been shot and killed under the hill at Howard and Montgomery Avenue. Some sources say Hope and Montgomery. Two men named Edwin Travis and Lot Moorhead were the ones who came across her body. This incident had occurred about two hours before, but this was the first that the detective was hearing of it. At this point, 
Frank understands that his sleep must wait. It was his job to immediately hop on any murder case that comes his way. Frank gets to the station a little after one in the morning. He meets Lieutenant Scott there, who is so thrilled to see him. Frank walks over and the girl is laid out on a stretcher, of course, lifeless. The girl had been taken to the hospital first, officially pronounced dead, and then brought to the station. It was obvious that she had been a beautiful girl in life. Her face though was disfigured from the bullet that had entered through her left eye. It would have hit her brain and killed her instantly. The girl looked no older than 19 years old, definitely still in her teenage years, and she looked like she lived a respectful life, probably coming from a good family with considerable values. Hundreds and hundreds of people had already come in to view the body to help identify the girl. She had been identified as 19-year-old Annie Klaus. Frank hears a racket in the next room over, and then a man busts through the door, an elderly German man in a panic screaming, my Annie, my Annie. This man was the girl's father, Henry Klaus. He worked as a shoemaker. He and his family lived at 1637 North 2nd Street. When it comes to Annie, she was described by the Philadelphia Times as having long black hair, rosy cheeks, big black eyes. Yes, they said that her eyes were black, but I think they just meant that her eyes were so dark that they could have been mistaken for black. But this is the same newspaper that commented on her beautifully developed form which in my opinion is an unnecessary and unneeded thing to say about a girl that was just murdered. It was also said that earlier in the day, on the very day she was murdered, she jokingly told one of the mill hands where she worked, I'll be dead in a week. Are you going to send flowers to my funeral? Coincidental, or did she have a strange intuition, which wouldn't be the only one involved in this case. Frank, of course, lets her father have a quick moment of grieving, but he had to work fast. The killer was most likely still in the area and every moment counts. Frank asks him some pretty usual questions. He asks him if she frequently attended parties, you know, the night before it had been a Friday night and all. Henry says no. Frank asks if she had a boyfriend. Henry says not that he knows of. Frank asks where she worked. Henry says she worked at the stocking mills at Hailthorpe and Dauphin. About the incident, Frank said, I am the last man to believe in intuitions or to form a theory on nothing, but at those words of his, I saw that girl as though she was pictured on a canvas screen, looking out of the stocking mill window and flirting with the conductors of the old green line whose trolley cars came down Frankfurt Road, crossed over Huntington Street, went down Coral to Dauphin, over Dauphin to Second, and down Second to Dock Street. Young womanhood blooming with rare beauty, denied at home the natural innocent pleasure of her years, would be exceptional and not flirting a little sometimes. Frank then asks Henry if she would catch a ride home from work at times. Henry said he thought that Annie only caught a ride if it had been rainy outside, but that Annie's sister, 16-year-old Lizzie Klaus, back at home, would definitely know. So Frank, Henry, and other law enforcement as well all head over to the Klaus home. Now, when Annie was found, she had a basket of bakery goods laying next to her, which her father said was normal because she often stopped before work at a bakery that two of his other daughter's husbands co-owned together. This bakery was named Reinhardt and Stahl and it was located at 810 North Street. Frank starts questioning Lizzie about Annie's usual routine after work though, how she usually got home. Lizzie stated that Annie rode home when it rained, but sometimes when it didn't. Frank asked if there had been anyone at work that Annie maybe flirted with a little or got a little close to. Annie's sister ends up telling him about a conductor, a conductor whose actual name she did not know. And when I say actual name, you'll see what I mean later. She describes his features and he possessed albino features, meaning he lacked pigment in his hair and skin. This can affect people of all ethnic backgrounds and is quite rare, so the detective knew he would be able to spot him a bit easier this way. This though rings a bell for Annie's father. He suspects that this man may be involved in his daughter's murder. It was someone that he told Annie to stay away from after finding out that the man 
was said to be married. Annie's sister said that Annie's friend may be able to tell them more about Annie and this man. They head over to this friend's home. This friend's name was Emma Richter, a friend who fainted when she heard that Annie had been killed. After coming to, she was ready to answer some questions to track down the wanted individual. This friend said that the man's name was Thomas Lynn. Okay, so we have a name. She described him as being about five feet, seven inches tall, slim, light complexion, and a small blonde mustache. This was really all that this friend seemed to know about Annie and this man, but one of Annie's sisters said that Annie's best friend, her best friend in the entire world, was a girl named Louisa Fania. So they all headed over to Louisa's house. This friend, just like the previous one, fainted as well when learning of Annie's demise. They asked her about this man and she did know a little more. She said that she knew nothing of this man being romantically involved with Annie, but she said that Annie did seem to wait for him after work and always boarded his car to go home. Law enforcement though, at this time, ended up finding out another name. Louisa said that she was introduced to this man and when she was introduced to him, she claimed that his name was Mr. Snyder. <laughs> So what was his actual name? We have Thomas Lynn and Mr. Snyder. Sometime during the night, they did end up going through Annie's room, looking through her belongings to find any clues, but that didn't really get them anywhere. They decide that it's time to go to this man's place of work. So they head over to the second and third street depot at Frankfurt Road. There, they found a night watchman named Mike. They asked him about this man named Thomas Lynn who possibly worked there but no man named Tom Lynn worked there. After describing his features though to the watchman, Mike said that his actual name was Otto Kaiser. They got a place of residence out of Mike when it came to an address for the man and started heading over to the Kaiser home. I did a little bit of newspaper researching myself and found a few good articles from primarily the Philadelphia Times. Kaiser seemed to be a liar from day one of meeting Annie, which had been back in 1882 at a bicentennial. He had originally given Annie a false name. Otto Kaiser told Annie that his name was Thomas Lynn, that he wasn't married and he lived on North 6th Street, which all lies. Hi, editing Gabby here, just popping in to say that if you did not do the math, if they met in 1882, that means that she was 12 years old at the time and he would have been around 18. Yeah. He also apparently told Annie that he lived with his grandmother. It was said that Annie did end up finding out his real name eventually, but she absolutely refused to believe that he was a married man. It was said that Annie was positively in love with Otto. Otto, who was described by the newspaper and others as well, as being a quiet, peaceful man in love with his wife and two children, that he was well known and well liked in the area. Goes to show that you never really know a person, do ya? They get to a home located at 2768 Kensington Avenue, and the man there tells them that the Kaisers moved some time ago. He acted like he didn't really know what the detective was talking about. Frank ends up speaking to a friend of his who lived nearby and asks if he knows where Otto may live currently. The friend points out the home and the officers make their way over to the home, which is located at 2738 Kensington Avenue, just up the street. This is where Otto lived with his wife, Mary, two children and his brother. Frank goes to the door with Captain Quirk and Lieutenant Scott. They knock, no answer. They keep knocking, still no answer. So they do the only thing fitting and kick the door, attempting to make as much of a bang as possible. They manage to get the attention of Otto and Otto, he peers out the window asking who's there. He sees the group of now five officers on the sidewalk. I'm not sure the other two officers' names, but Lieutenant Scott screams up to the window and he says that Otto is wanted at the depot, that he's wanted at the depot to take out an extra car. And Otto knew that this was not their reasoning for being there. He knew that they were after him for the murder 
of his secret sweetheart, Annie. The top of the door of the home was glass that the officers were knocking on. And all of a sudden they see a shadowy figure coming their way. A woman opens the door, a woman holding a young child and blood is pouring out of her neck. The woman's neck was cut ear to ear and she says to them, my God, my God, let me out. My husband's cut my throat. They start running inside. They run inside, they see a man, and the man says, no, 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 I'm, I'm not who you want. You want my brother, he's upstairs. So they start running upstairs as fast as they can. They look up the stairs as they turn the first landing and see Otto, and they know it's Otto. He runs for his bedroom. They're running full speed at him up the stairs. As they enter the room, he does what he did to his wife, but to himself. And with much force, more force than he did with his wife's neck, he cuts his throat. Otto dies right in front of them on his bed, the bed where his other child is still sound asleep. Everyone is obviously completely in shock. Otto is dead, but now they have to rush his wife, Mary, to the hospital to make sure that she doesn't die as well. She took 60 stitches in her neck like a champ with nothing to numb her pain, she did end up living. After she was in recovery, they questioned her and she said that her husband came home that night and was drinking heavily and she knew something had happened. According to the Philadelphia Times, Otto had come home asking for Pops, which was Mary's father who lived down the street. Otto said that he had done something horrible lost his job at the cars and needed to tell Pops his secret. He kept saying, oh, what an awful deed I've done. Mary's parents were both at the home by then. He's still on a tangent. And Otto keeps saying that he committed a terrible crime and he needed forgiveness. He then whips out a revolver, a revolver that they didn't even know he had. Two officers were then called over to disarm him. He was disarmed but everyone was still extremely frightened. Otto calms down a little bit. He tells his father-in-law and mother-in-law to head home, that he was tired and that he was just gonna go to bed. Everyone in the home heads to bed. Hours later, they were awoken by the officers downstairs after hearing what Lieutenant Scott said when he opened the window and screamed down to him. Otto went over to his wife and slit her throat, not once, but twice. Mary grabbed their youngest son, Richie, who was two and ran downstairs. Their other son, Charlie, who was three, was still sound asleep on the bed where his father later slit his own throat and died on. After what happened, the two boys were taken to their grandparents' home down the street. As Mary was being taken to the hospital, they asked her if she ever had any trouble with her husband and she said the words, no, always lived happy. Not long before everything happened, she did grow suspicious of him. She discovered that Otto had taken off of work after going on Tuesday, that he was complaining that he was sick and needed to take off of work. He had taken the rest of the week off of work, but he was gone from home that week as well with his wife, figuring that he was just at work. On Wednesday night, Mary noticed that Otto left the home with his opera glasses and candies in his pocket. This was believed to be the night when Annie and Otto had attended Kensington Theater to see Beacon Lights. On the night of the murder, he strangely asked his wife for a dollar before he left the home, which she did give him a dollar, but then his wife decided to follow him that night with a strange gut feeling to see where he was going on that Saturday night. But while following him, she lost track of him and just decided to head home. Two hours after she arrived home was about the time Annie was murdered. It seemed like Otto and Annie had spent the nights together that week while he was supposed to be at work. The very night that he killed her was the night he bought his revolver. He bought his revolver from a pawn shop right before they met up on Saturday. But what was the motive? Lieutenant Scott was quoted saying, the motive for committing the crime is 
a mystery. The motive for the crime has in all probability died with the man and the girl. I don't believe it will ever be known. Some people did have a guess as to why he possibly killed her. Some believed that possibly he wanted Annie to run away with him and that she declined. There was no proof though to back this up. Mary was quoted saying by the Philadelphia Times, I am not sorry for him. It is better that he is dead. I am sorry for the poor girl, for she was innocent. I wonder if they will let me get up tomorrow. I would like to see the devil. When she said devil, she was referring to seeing her dead husband on ice as they kept his body preserved. They did show Annie's sister and Annie's two friends Otto's body with Annie's friend saying that he was the man who claimed that his name was Tom Lynn. The officers who worked on the case have of course long passed away. Frank Geyer said that in looking back over the brief history of the case, it seemed to him that it wouldn't have been solved without that little flash of intuition he had at the very beginning of learning about who she was and where she worked. This intuition led him to solve a nearly impossible crime in an unbelievable amount of time. Tracking one person to another to another, putting together pieces of a puzzle that led him right to the killer's doorstep in one night, in one bitterly cold, mentally and physically exhausting night. One insane aspect of this case is that right across the street from where Annie was murdered, there was a man using a revolver shooting rats in his building. And they definitely would have, of course, thought that he took the life of Annie if they had tracked him down. He was right across the street using a revolver. But the fact that they had Otto's gun already at the station from when they confiscated it earlier proved it to be the one that was used on Annie they were different calibers. So I know that was a short video for Solve September, but that is the case of Annie Klaus, a case that is so tragic and really unlike any other case I've ever heard. A case that has been lost in time, but solved through old fashioned police work. And if it happened in today's time would be honestly captivating enough to result in the making of a Netflix docu-series. I think the only cases that I've ever really come across where the case was solved in one night were cases where it was just 100% obvious what had happened and they just had to track the person down. If you want to possibly learn more about this case, I have all of my sources down below in the description of this video, including historicalcrimedetective.com and where you can buy the book. <laughs> this video isn't sponsored in any way. It's just a great book and I can't wait for volume two. If you've read it yourself, definitely let me know down below in the comments. I think sometimes with older cases, especially ones over a hundred years old, people have this view of them that they're a bit boring. And I get comments sometimes saying things like, oh, you only cover vintage cases, like I'm out next. And in my opinion, the older ones are the ones that are most interesting to me and the ones that I love researching the most. The only unfortunate aspect other than of course the crime itself is the fact that since it happened so long ago there are sometimes very few photos in existence or photos for a researcher to dig up. For instance, I unfortunately I couldn't find a photo of Annie or Otto to show you all. I'm sorry. Let me know though what you thought of this case and we are getting to the end of Solve September. So if there are any last minute solved cases that you might want me to cover on my channel, make sure to send those over to gabulosiscaserequests at gmail.com. I hope you all have a great rest of your day or night, wherever you are, stay safe and I will see you all in the next one.